Mount Pleasant, described at one point by some as the most diverse neighborhood in the district. Today, it looks a bit different. Many of the folks who lived here in the 80s and 90s have been priced out. Gentrification's brush painting a more affluent and cookie cutter picture. These streets are full of history though. You just need uh, you know, a match to be lit. Uh, the, the embers are all there, uh, ready. And that's exactly what happened in, in 91, is that um, the embers were ready. More than 32 years ago, a riot broke out in the northwest neighborhood of Mount Pleasant. An eruption of violence set off after a Latino man was shot by a rookie DC police officer. It's an answer, you know, to police brutality on one side, you know, but also it's the kind of condition of life that we have here. It was a battle because I think that the people were just really sick and tired of, you know, being treated like we were scum, you know? And, and, and suddenly all hell broke loose. Broken glass, charred vehicles, clashes with armored clad cops. Guerrilla warfare in the nation's capital. All of it happening here on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 1991. Pero lo que éramos éramos invisibles. Y de nuevo hay que recordar de que el incidente que detonó la, los disturbios fue un acto de violencia entre la policía y la comunidad. From the ashes of the uprising came a renewed charge to improve the lives of Latinos in the district. It is perhaps the most consequential event in the history of Hispanics in Washington. Turning pain into purpose, resulting in progress for Latinos. But even as we stand here today, there's still hurdles the community has yet to clear. I'm Mauricio Casillas, and this is the story of Los Disturbios de Mount Pleasant. But what was it that led up to that boiling point? How did this neighborhood erupt? To understand that is to understand the cultural makeup of Mount Pleasant in the 1990s a history that was shaped by the diaspora of Central Americans, mostly Salvadorans, fleeing a country that was marred by civil war. The government and rebels have suffered heavy losses during 10 days of intense fighting. Almost a thousand people have been killed there since the fighting began nine days ago. What do you remember of what life was like growing up in El Salvador, leading up to the moment when you said, I have to get out of here? Well, I grew up a peasant, you know? So we were um, working poor. You know, my grandma had like three parcels of land. We worked the land. Um, so it was country. Uh, most of my classmates went to school with no shoes on because they couldn't afford shoes. People were just sick and tired of the military dictatorships that had ruled our countries for more than 50 years. You know, the country smelled like death for a while. And that's when the guerrilla movement said, if they're gonna come this hard at us, we have to come hard too. The Central American kids had their own set of issues because they were fleeing war-torn countries. So in, when I, by the early 80s, mid 80s, we were starting to deal with much more homelessness much more mental health issues. By 1980, by the time the, Sa the Salvadoran Civil War breaks out, there's already a pipeline that's been established from El Salvador to Washington, D.C. So there was this exodus, man, I mean, by the thousands. And all of a sudden, D.C. is like, what? You know, who are these people? What the hell are they doing here? And um, the city was not prepared for, for such change. Central Americans were culturally very different from the Latino communities that had already been established in D.C. before the 1980s. From the 40s, the difference is that the Latinos that were here during that time were Latinos from the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Etc. Many of these new migrants settled in Mount Pleasant. And Mount Pleasant has always been this kind of like little village. And I don't think that there's any other place in D.C. that is like Mount Pleasant. It was about 35% uh, white 
about 25% to 30% African-American and the rest Latino. The most segregated place for me growing up was the lunchroom at my high school. And you would see the divisions clearly, right? And it's like, it, it, it really, and there were along ethnic lines, white, black, and Latino. So you have um, a lot of folks who come out of rural areas in El Salvador, so education is a really important piece because, you, because the access to education for where they're coming from is relatively limited. How would you describe that tension that was there? You have real discontent among the youth because they, schools don't treat them well, there's no, there's no recreation for them, there's nothing organized for them. To, with, the, with the exception of a couple of community organizations, right? Okay, the life condition in this, in this area, you know, are, are incredible. You have not see all the buildings, how people live, you know. We don't have social services, we don't have a, a rehabilitation program in Spanish, you know, we don't have housing. It's terrible, the situation is terrible. So nowhere else in D.C. did you see that um, significant a mix of Latino, black, and white in one neighborhood. There's no question about it. There was a growing uh, sense of tension. Uh, the white community had dominated the culture, uh, decision-making of Washington, D.C. The black community, for the first time, was feeling that, you know, they, it, we were on a path to have some empowerment, uh, starting with the uh, 74, you know, home rule legislation. And for once, we, we, our voices were being expressed. And we were consumed with each other the white and black community. And there was now a, a significant influx of people from Central America, particularly El Salvador. There were a clash of cultures about expectations of what was fun to do, what, you know, what gatherings were appropriate, etc. You know, it is customary in, especially in the tropics, you know, because it's hot. So people get out of their houses and go under a tree or find shade. And after work, they talk. They play cards. They play checkers. And the cops did not like that. These people started talking about loud music. People started talking about um, all kinds of stereotypes. Hasn't there been a problem with police in the Hispanic community for a while? Uh, there, there have been tensions, and the, and the tensions uh, don't aren't, aren't exclusive between the, the police and the Hispanic community. The, the tensions are, are, are in many expressed in many, many different ways uh, between the various communities, uh, and, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. On top of racial and ethnic clashes among the people of Mount Pleasant, there was major tension with the Metropolitan Police Department. There was this frustration, particularly with the police as a young person, right? Because like you necessarily didn't see them as, as a resource. And, and, and unfortunately, that's still true for a lot of young people in a lot of communities of color, right? That's not necessarily particular to ours, but that was there. My, my personal desire is to want to see more, more police who can speak Spanish and also more Hispanic officers, and I think that would help a lot. Because the attitude of the police was Hey, you here, you better speak English. The police here on Washington, D.C., the capital of Washington, D.C., Miami, California, and a lot of states in the United States, police made discrimination with the Latin people. The boiling tension uh, came from, you know, that, that, that gap that the Latino community had between them and the Metropolitan Police Department. Why? because there weren't a lot of Latino police officers in the police department that could service and understand the Latino community. And you have to understand that within the Salvadorian community and Central American migrants, their perception of policing is very different because in their particular country, the police many times play a very oppressive role. They know, they know, you know, the, the people don't have the paper, you know, green card and something like that. They, they beat the people. I think we have to understand that before the, you know, the cameras, everybody having cameras on their phones, we didn't see a lot of the police abuse. A lot of that happened in the darkness, but it was happening. In, 
1991, Cinco de Mayo. Um, this guy is belligerent in a restaurant. They tell him to chill out. He doesn't. And so one of the folks out drinking that day was a man named Daniel Gomez, Daniel Enrique Gomez. And he was a, a dishwasher at Georgetown University. Officer Angela Jewell, who was a rookie female African-American police officer, felt that her life was in danger. And then it gets really murky. You had 50 people who saw 50 different things. Okay, take it from the top. Tell me what you saw. I had a police officer. She was patrolled in the Mount Pleasant area. She, was, she observed guys over in the park drinking. She rode around, told them to put their beverages down. They didn't want to put their beverages down. The guy started cursing at her. She walked over, placed him under arrest. She put one handcuff on him. He broke away from her, pushed her, and pulled out a knife. At that point, the subject produced what was believed to be a, a hunting knife, a fairly large knife. And he, you know, he was fighting the police and stuff, and, and she shot him. And, you know, she just shot him. She said that he had some kind of, she had, he had something on him, but he didn't have nothing on him. He just shot him. I probably know just as much as anyone else. Uh, we were hearing reports from the people coming around here, uh, the church, that uh, a man was arrested, and apparently there was a shooting involved at the same time. Uh, the subject then lunged towards the officer who was in uniform, in full uniform. At that point, she uh, gave him uh, several uh, orders to drop the weapon. He refused to do that. Uh, she fired one round, striking the subject in the chest. He pulled out the knife. She ordered him three times to stop the hawk. He wouldn't stop. He tried to get closer to her. She shot him. One shot? One shot. Because the police have said that he had a weapon on them. He didn't have no weapon on him. And how could he get to the weapon if his hands were handcuffed? And we don't know the facts. We don't know exactly what happened, but it seems to be the story that's circulating around the community. Unfortunately, uh, some of that information was uh, miscommunicated to the community. And your role here is to try to placate the community. We're, we've been trying. There's a lot of anger and a lot of rage among the people here right now. We received a call saying there was a revolt in Mount Pleasant. Y vinieron dos policías que ni eran hispanos ni hablaban español y después nos enteramos que tenían muy poca experiencia, eran rookies. Y en primer lugar estaban borrachos, en segundo lugar no entendían lo que estaban diciendo y se empezó a congregar un grupo y se asustaron. And this is before computers or cell phones. So my word just got out. About whether Daniel Gomez was dead or alive, was he, hand, was he handcuffed or not? You know, so kids were angry. And adults were angry. I mean, it wasn't just the young people. The facts are what followed. Uh, mayhem. Chief Fullwood alerted me. Uh, that we had an incident. I don't know, and everyone knew at the moment that it would escalate, but understandably it did escalate because it, it was, it was a, a powder keg already there. El grupo, ¿quién eran? Eran jóvenes centroamericanos, muchos de ellos que venían de la Guerra del Salvador, eh, guerrilleros urbanos, hasta cierto punto, que luchaban contra eh, eh, los militares, el gobierno, Y, y ellos se ofendieron y se asustaron también. I was five blocks away with a bunch of friends. We were drinking beer and just chilling, watching TV. And then we said, hey, we're out of beers. And we sent somebody to the corner for a beer run. And he comes back, hey, put the, put the news on. Something's going on unpleasant. And there it is, you know, cameras. And oh, man, and the, the fight was already on. They'd take the flares from the glove compartment, open up the gas tank, light that flare, pop it down, boom. Never really seen that in D.C. before. That came straight from the streets of El Salvador. That came straight from the war. So the war at El Salvador came here. Y entonces empezaron a, quem a quemar todos los basureros. Y empezaba la Mount Pleasant por la noche a aparecer eh, eh, como una hoguera por toda la calle. Y cogieron a la ciudad en desprevisto. Eh, 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 era una población nueva. 
eh, eran jóvenes que todavía no estaban integrados, que no tenían trabajos, que no tenían educación. More than anything was scary. It was very scary to see, and it was very distressing um, to see that it had come to that, and that it takes a community uprising that way for people to pay attention. Mind you, we're talking about Washington, D.C., a mile from the White House. This was very unheard of. There was a lot of pushback, pushback among some that I shouldn't go there. You don't know what, what's going to go, go on. But, you know, I had a sense that, uh, you know, we, we had to reach out and try to bridge whatever tensions that might exist. On day two, the chaos continued, and Mayor Sharon Dixon declared a curfew. And so as dusk began to fall the second night, everyone was wondering what was going to happen. Would there be a repeat of the first night? Would there be peace and calm and tranquility? Did the involvement of local community leaders, did the pleas of the Latino leadership for calm and for peace, would those be heeded? The war was spreading. So around five o'clock, that second day, I mean, there were more cameras, the priests and community leaders were out there with megaphones. But not be angry with all of the people here. We live here. And all of a sudden, sh just got me. Go home. Go home. And then the riot police, you heard it. With their batons and their, and once they came to like Irvin Street, Mount Pleasant, Irvin, that's when they started firing the tear gas, and everybody started started hurling all kinds of shit. And what were you doing at that point? Were you observing? Were you taking no, part? I was throwing bricks at the cops. I, I you know, I, I I was helping. We opened our apartment so that people could go and wet their faces. And Mayor Dixon told Chief Ike Fullwood, in no uncertain terms, you are not to shoot. They could shoot tear gas, and those canisters did harm and wound people, but they could not shoot either rubber bullets or live bullets. So no life was lost. So the second night, it wasn't only a Latino uprising, it was a Latino and African American uprising, and they looted stores, and it spread in a much more violent fashion in terms of material loss, not human life loss, but material loss on the part of shopkeepers who often had sunk their entire life savings into these stores. Some of these were immigrant shopkeepers. They lost their life savings because their stores were unprotected and the police did not physically bar looters from taking anything. It, it helped. Uh, I guess to wake up the leadership a little bit about the necessity, the needs of a community that had come from a civil war. And now here we are kind of relieving uh, the helicopter. Da -da 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 well, you know. So for a lot of us, it was somehow traumatic because you never thought that you would come into the United States to fight the way that you fought in the country. Let's clear the street. Let's go in the house. Let's clear the street. I have to go inside, please. By the third day, D.C. police amped up enforcement of the curfew and most of the violence died down. But the spotlight on the Latino community was far from dimming down. It was, one, it was a moment in time where a community said, we're here. That forced all the stakeholders to wake up to the fact that there was a new community here. Riots are the voice of the unheard. It's unfortunate no, that those things do happen in such violent ways. But at the same time, I think it comes a point when people's anger just boils over and, 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 and there's something in you that says, uh-uh, no more, you know, no more.
It is perhaps the most consequential event in the history of Hispanics in Washington. You got to understand, after that, everybody knew where Mount Pleasant was. <laughs> you didn't have to tell people, yeah, I'm from the Mount Pleasant. They just, oh, yeah, Mount Pleasant. It's, it's both as a solemn moment of reality in a community that was uh, underserved, underrepresented, uh, um, and then the fact that that very same community took advantage of that opportunity and, and moved forward. Bibi Otero and Pedro Aviles were among those in the Latino community who really pushed the D.C. administration for change. They helped form the Latino Civil Rights Task Force in the wake of the riots. We, as a community, had an opportunity to engage with the uh, um, mayor and establish communication channels that we didn't have. We developed uh, a manifesto of sorts uh, that laid out our uh, demand. They wanted more resources to be allocated to Latino social services and other organizations. They said, look, we make up 10% of the city's population. We deserve 10% of the resources. We deserve 10% of city jobs. So why are other folks, black folks, white folks, getting city jobs? The task force also successfully petitioned the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to look into the root problems that Latinos faced in the district. Two years after the riots, the commission released a scathing 173-page report which condemned the treatment of Latinos and documented the systemic and institutional obstacles that they faced. The report stated, quote, In calling for an investigation by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the district's Latino community presented three main allegations to the commission. First, that there existed a pattern or practice of abuse, harassment, and misconduct by the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department against the Latino community. Second, that Hispanic representation in the District of Columbia government is not proportionate to the community's representation in the general population of the District of Columbia. And moreover, that the disproportionate representation was the result of discrimination by the district government. And third, that the Latino community was not receiving its fair share of government services. After examining these allegations, the commission has found the allegations to have been justified." End quote. With the impatience and the assertiveness coming from the Latino community uh, that this incident triggered, uh, I think we also had more of a constituency to, to move in a more positive, inclusive direction. So we uh, in started including more bilingual police officers, more bilingual literature, established community centers in the Mount Pleasant community. Out of the riots comes the LEDC, the Latino Economic Development Corporation. There had not been a hub for economic development and LEDC becomes that and now LEDC is a multi-jurisdictional organization that provides loans for small businesses, etc. Would it have happened had the riots not happened? Probably, but much slower and with a much less coordinated kind of effort of demands and, and, um, and um, focus around this issue. But as the years went by, the momentum that was generated by Latino leadership began to stall and many of the initiatives that they pushed for weren't funded. The problem was that the bigger picture is in the city, Mayor Dixon was still dealing with a massive budget deficit that had been left by the outgoing Barry administration. Massive. Tens of millions of dollars. But after a while it petered out and, and uh, what we hoped would be a leading Hispanic organization in town didn't last more than five and six years. But the whole evolution of the way Latinos were seen by the city came naturally after that. Because it's, it was an invisible community and suddenly became very, very visible. So, so something had to be done. And I will tell you that we've had um, Latino ANC commissioners. We've had a Latino school board member. We've had a, a Latino uh, shadow representative. But in the, in the political structure of Washington, D.C., very few Latinos, very few. So I do think there's a clear, um, you know, there's many examples of where things have improved, but there's still systemic issues that hold not only Latino kids back, but African-American kids back as well. 
Um, now, DC still has not achieved much uh, Latino political power. You can see that from, from this picture. Bibi Otero is one of the few Latinas to have held a high-level position in D.C. government, serving as the deputy mayor for Health and Human Services for four years, a post that she was thankful to have, but... The reality is that it's, it was really unfortunate that it was so late and so unique, right? Um, that to have high-level... We have, we have no elected officials. Um, and um, I ran for office once in 1992. Um, but we have no elected officials. Pero también empezaron a entrar latinos en diferentes partes de diferentes agencias. Que pues claro, el momento que ya entra gente que es representativa, el servicio también cambia. Hay mucho que hacer todavía, verdad? Yo creo que hay. Eh, pero yo me siento como orgulloso que que estoy parado, como dicen, en los hombros de los que vinieron antes. Creo que cada generación está abriendo un poco más, está uh, dándole oportunidades a nuestra comunidad de integrarse más a lo que es Washington. Hola, hola. In April of 2022, a new wave of migrants began to make its way to the district. They were bussed in by the governors of Texas and Arizona, who say their states were overwhelmed and wanted to put political pressure on so-called sanctuary cities like D.C. It got picked up by the larger immigrant community. Right. Abel Nunez runs the Central American Resource Center, a nonprofit that has helped migrants for decades in the district. He says he sees strong parallels between the Salvadorian migration of the 1980s and the one we're seeing today, which primarily involves migrants fleeing from Venezuela. The fact that there is a community here that had a similar experience for different reasons, but similar, um, you can see how we're in, in, in one way, you know, paying it forward to make sure that the next generation has it maybe just a little bit better. They're looking for better lives. They're looking for sustainable existences. They're looking for safety. They're looking for security. Um, and they're looking to, to be able to raise their families in, in, a, in, a, in a way in which their families can thrive and prosper. And that's the same thing that people fleeing the wars in Central America were looking for in the 80s. So in that respect, there's a tremendous amount of similarity. I remember what was said about us when we first came. It's the same thing, seeing that people say, oh my God, they're a burden to the city. They're just stretching our, our things. You know, 40 years later, we're an integral part of this community, right? With the workforce, culturally. I mean, everybody knows what a pupusa is and enjoys. It, and I'm like, the same thing is going to happen with the Venezolanos, right? Uh, they will bring their culture, they, they will bring their labor, they will bring everything to, to, to the forefront of this community. And we as a community, as a D.C. community, we're going to be richer for it, right? More than three decades later, it's clear that Latinos are here to stay in the district. Life has improved for the community. Many of those improvements born out of three chaotic days here in Mount Pleasant. Eh, mucho ha cambiado. Puedo decir eso. Eso sucedió en el 1991. Eh, el departamento se dio de cuenta en aquel entonces que necesitábamos darle ese acercamiento a la comunidad hispana. Hoy en día vemos como 400 oficiales latinos. So estamos representando más a la comunidad hispana. Estamos llevándoles recursos y servicios. Estamos diciéndole, no somos su enemigo, somos su amigo. There's still this perception on the part of a lot of Americans that we're the help, you know? That we're the waiter, that I'm here to change your life, home. you know? That I'm here to, you know, cut a tree, uh, you know, that's what expectation is, and I say to people, no, we own our own businesses, you know, we're lawyers, we're doctors. 32 years removed from the riots, what do you think the lasting legacy of it is? That you don't mess with us, you know, we know what injustice is, we know it for a long time. We have contributed so much as a community. We continue to contribute so much as a community. Um, much of the progress of the city wouldn't happen without having an immigrant community that is a workforce. So it's those kinds of things that I want us to be remembered, not remembered, but to recognize that that's who we are as members of this community. A lot of us thought we were passing by, but now this is home. 
and we're not part of the fabric of the city, you know, whether you like it or not. <laughs>